Welcome everyone to webinar number five of this series with Thoroughbred Breeders Victoria and AgriFutures. I'm Justin Darcy, Thoroughbred Breeders Victoria's Media Marketing Officer, and I introduce Annalise McGaw, AgriFutures Thoroughbred Horses Program Manager, Dr. Zamira Gibb from the University of Newcastle, and Dr. Aliona Swigan from the University of Newcastle. AgriFutures do a wonderful job, of course, for our industry, investing into research on issues that affect the whole of agriculture. Now, just a reminder that this session will be recorded. So if anyone is looking to watch a replay or if anyone couldn't make it tonight, it can be seen, it will be seen on both of our YouTube channels. And I just ask for all questions to be held until the end of each presentation, and I'll make sure that uh, they're passed on to our speakers. Now, let's get stuck straight into it. I'll ask Annalise to speak a little bit about what AgriFutures do. Excellent. Thanks very much, Justin. I really appreciate you doing this for us. So uh, thank you everybody for joining me here today. Uh, I'm just going to talk, a, have a bit of a chat about the um, the AgriFutures Thoroughbred Horses Program. And then I'm just going to have a brief mention about uh, our uh, Thoroughbred Horses Program five-year plan that is now open for consultation. So I'm going to give a quick overview of the levy and also the plan that is open for consultation now. And then Dr. Aliona Swigan will speak and then Dr. Zamira Gibbs. So it's going to be a great night. So just to quickly go through uh, the thoroughbred horses levy is that the uh, $10 from every mare returned is paid by the mare owner and $10 for every mare served is paid by the stallion um, owner. And then we invest this levy on behalf of the thoroughbred breeders into research extension and development. Um, we're also very lucky that this uh, these levies also attract a matching uh, amount from the Commonwealth Government, which is 50 cents for every dollar spent on R&D. We're also a really lucky program because we get quite a lot of industry contributions and we've received industry contributions from the Hunter Valley Equine Research Foundation, from Equestrian Australia, from various vets, uh, Racing, New Racing Australia. So it's, um, yeah, it's great. It's a really good program. We have 24 currently ongoing projects uh, and some of our key achievements include managing heat stress in stallions, a quicker test for chlamydia and herpes, development of a fertility assessment device for stallions, which we'll talk about today, and also industry, industry support such as sponsoring fast track applicants. And on your screen there, you will see the latest uh, snapshot. So every year we the uh, Thoroughbred Horses Program uh, develops a, a research extension, a research development and extension snapshot. And that is a publication that is on our website, which gives a, an update on all current and recently finalised research that the program has. So the next thing I want to talk about is the Thoroughbred Horses Program uh, Research Development and Extension Plan that will go from uh, the end of this year until 2027. And what I want to talk about in particular is why do we have a plan, how the plan was developed, and then I'll go into some detail about the different priorities that are in the plan. So we have a plan and each one of our industries that AgriFutures has, has a program RDNE plan. And we do that so that we can guide the investment of levies, uh, matching funds and industry contributions into priorities identified by industry through research development and extension. So the plan commenced development uh, a number of years ago when we first, when we did the midterm assessment of the current plan, the 2017, to 2022 plan. We did a midterm assessment of that plan. And then at the end of this plan, we did a uh, full term assessment to, to understand the economic impact our research was having. Uh, then we conducted uh, in depth interviews with 26 levy payers to understand what their needs were and also conducted an online survey for other uh, industry stakeholders to participate in and a draft was draft plan was then developed. 
This was then reviewed and edited by the Thoroughbred Horses Program Advisory Panel uh, and has been finalised and is now open for public consultation. Public consultation will go until the 10th of October. Uh, and I, again, we'll put another link in the chat shortly about how you can get to the new plan and how you can provide a comment on the new plan. Once the public consultation is finished, we will uh, incorporate edits and then it will go to the AgriFutures uh, Agri Futures Board for endorsement in December. So these are the five priorities that we have listed for the Thoroughbred Horses Program. Um, and our overarching goal is to improve the sustainability, productivity and competitiveness of the Australian thoroughbred industry. Uh, and I will just go through these in a little bit more detail. So priority one is about enhancing the thoroughbred horse welfare, human safety and environmental sustainability. Realistically, welfare is at the at the core of everything we do with the with the thoroughbred industry. And so it was very important that this was clearly articulated as our number one priority for the thoroughbred horses program plan. Our main, main activities around horse welfare will include strategies to reduce injury breakdown and premature uh, breakdown of horses, also to uh, minimise the impact of climate change on horses, mares, stallions and racehorses as well. Uh, and then also research associated with the outcomes of the Thoroughbred Aftercare uh, Welfare Working Group or the TOR group. When it comes to human injury uh, and illness, we want to look into research to reduce the risks associated with uh, human injury, but also reduce the risk of uh, zoonotic diseases. Then environmental sustainability, this will be about developing baseline data on the thoroughbred industry's impact on the environment, such as our carbon footprint. Priority two is around improving thoroughbred horse breeding efficiency. We'll be covering a bit of this tonight actually, but in particular our activities will include uh, supporting native natural mating and using possibly using technology from the uh, human reproductive um, industries. Uh, then we'll look to improve breeding outcomes and also in, increase healthy foals. Uh, increase the number of live foals and yearlings, including understanding the drivers behind live foal percentages and what it, what it takes to improve them over the next 10 years. Improving the understanding of risks associated with delivering a live foal and then also a possible uh, national fetal post-mortem database. Then with yearlings, we're going to look into pre-sale radiography and also endoscopies and how that can be, how, what is the actual impact of those and how they can be improved. Priority three is around uh, reducing productivity losses and welfare issues um, caused by disease and parasites. Uh, our activities will include reducing the impact of disease and parasites. Uh, this will include foal diseases, diseases and parasites and anthelmintic resistance, and then also antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we'll also look at emerging pests and diseases. We have something called the Rapid Response Fund, which is funding available for emerging issues that is quickly available. And then we'll also look at uh, Hendra and other, um, and other emerging zoonotic diseases. Priority four is to increase the industry familiarity with the program, but also to develop a capable workforce. Uh, activities around this will include uh, career opportunities and pathways, uh, supporting industry initiatives such as Fast Track, uh, considering opportunities on how to drive the inclusion of Indigenous, uh, Indigenous Australians within the thoroughbred industry, supporting scholarships, but also training and succession planning for the advisory panel. Within communications and extension, we want to look at implementing the stakeholder needs analysis, which was conducted last year, uh, understanding effective communication of research findings, and then also engaging with industry uh, in a, such things as like this webinar, but also other events and newsletters. 
The final priority is around um, providing up-to-date estimates of socio-economic contributions to allow the industry to demonstrate its value to the Australian economy. And this is all about understanding economic contributions of the thoroughbred breeding industry. And this is a previous version on your screen that we have, um, we have completed previously and we'd like to update those numbers. So importantly, this is all available on our website and I will add the links uh, into the chat after this. Uh, and I would appreciate if you could get on there and have a look and provide any comments. So back over to you, Justin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Annalise. It was very insightful, those five priorities. And I just ask, AgriFutures does do an amazing amount of work. So if you can, please opt into any of their messaging channels. They're very insightful. And um, again, thank you very much for that, Annalise. But now I'd like to pass it on to Dr. Zamira Gibb. Um, welcome. And would you, be able to would you be able to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're talking about tonight? So my name's Amira Gibb. I'm from the Priority Research Centre in Reproductive Science at the University of Newcastle. Um, my background is in animal science and I have a PhD in veterinary science. Um, and uh, most of what I do is for um, horse industry, horse reproduction work, but I also do a little bit in, uh, in cattle and humans um, and uh, hopefully bees and uh, have done a bit of oyster work in the past. So tonight, um, thanks for the opportunity of being able to speak with you tonight. Um, I'm going to be telling you about our project, uh, which is to develop a novel device for the on-farm assessment of stallion sperm fertility. And this is a project that I am doing with my colleague, Dr. Roisin Griffin, who is somewhere out in the wilds of Scone right now on, uh, on field work. Okay, so just a bit of background as to why this research is important. Um, obviously, in thoroughbreds, we don't routinely collect semen from them. So this differs from any other breed of horse, which uses um, artificial insemination. But the, the reason that this is significant is that because of this, we don't really have a lot of idea about the quality of an ejaculate that's being deposited into, into the mare's reproductive tract. When you collect semen, you can get an idea of the volume of the semen, the concentration of the sperm, um, and some idea as to how many um, potentially fertile sperm are being deposited into that female. So based on artificial insemination research, we know that at least um, 250 million progressively motile sperm need to be deposited into the female tract for optimum fertility. Um, and if we actually knew how many fertile sperm were in the thoroughbred ejaculate, um, perhaps we could better manage things like cross covers. So if there weren't enough sperm being deposited into the female at a, at a breeding, then we'd know that that female, that man, probably needs to be cross covered before she ovulates. I mean, on top of this, I'm talking about motile sperm, but actually motility is um, a pretty poor predictor of fertility. Obviously, if sperm isn't motile, it's going to be infertile. But you can have a sample that has pretty good motility and still poor fertility. And this is across all species. So this isn't unique to the horse. So there are other things at play here. And, you know, the reason that, that fertility is so important is um, because we need to get our mares pregnant early in the season in the thoroughbred industry um, because the industry favours um, those earlier born horses. So these early pregnancies are more valuable because younger horses are uh, smaller and also slower. So this is just a bit of background and this probably isn't news to any of you. Um, but there's this really great study that came out a few years ago, which showed that um, each day of age at a weanling sale is worth about $224. Um, so this means that, you know, uh, the youngest and oldest horse at a, at a weanling sale of equivalent um, um, pedigree and, and quality could differ in price um, up to about $32,000, which is a significant amount of money. And this follows through into later in life. Um, so as horses age, um, they get faster um, up until about five or six years old when it starts to plateau off. Um, and if you do the maths uh, over an 1800 metre race, those younger horses, for those younger horses, a, a two month age difference can um, equate to about a two second difference in finish time. And obviously that can be the difference between winning and losing that race. So, you know, it's important that, that the mares are, are bred and the foals are born as close to the 1st of August as possible, but you all know this. Um, but the way that we can try and do this is to ensure 
um, the best chance of pregnancy on every estrus cycle um, so that we don't have to wait until the next cycle, you know, and that foal is then going to be, you know, three weeks younger than it would potentially be. So in this image here, we have um, stallion sperm bound to oviduct epithelial cells. So this is in the um, in the mare's oviduct. So this is where the sperm will wait uh, for the egg at ovulation. <clears throat> So mares will accept um, a stallion for about four days before they ovulate um, during that estrus um, period. And in the wild, um, because these stallions have relatively small bands of mares, they might breed that mare up to seven times a day um, during that receptive period. So those in the wild, those stallions will breed those mares up to um, seven times a day. And, uh, you know, so that may, mare might be bred 28 times before she ovulates. And effectively what this does is it really increases the number of sperm that are sitting there in the oviduct waiting for that egg to come down. Now, obviously, this isn't a, a luxury that we have for thoroughbred horses who might be expected to impregnate over 200 mares in a 12-week um, window. And so any cross-covering activities need to be done ideally in a really structured way and only when absolutely necessary. So how can we when insufficient numbers of sperm have been deposited um, into the female after a breeding. To be able to do this, we really need to know what drives fertility in this species. And I'm not going to, uh, time doesn't allow me to get into this, but we spent um, a good four or five years um, basically working out what it was that drove fertility in horses more than anything else. And um, and this is the paper here. So if anyone um, wants to to nerd out, then there's your reference that you can go and check out. But long story short, sperm can produce energy via two methods: either via oxidative phosphorylation um, in the mitochondria or in the mid piece, or via glycolysis in the sperm tail. So most species use glycolysis. Um, however, we found that um, stallion sperm actually depends really heavily on oxidative phosphorylation. And this was one of the major drivers of fertility in this species. So we thought that this would be, you know, a good starting point to, um, to develop our device. And, uh, and the way that we thought that we would do this is using a chemical called rosazurin. So rosazurin um, is a chemical which changes not only color, but also fluorescence. Um, via mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation um, reactions. So it becomes highly fluorescent and it also um, becomes like a pinkish color. And this has been around for many, many years. Um, back in the 1930s, it was identified as a really easy way to identify um, contamination in milk samples and it's still used to this day. Um, and then a bit of a, a deeper dive uncovered a patent from the 1990s where someone um, patented a take-home kit for, um, for analysing your sperm quality using rosazurin. So we thought, well, that could be pretty easy. If we can just add rosazurin to semen and get a good readout of sperm metabolism, then that would be super handy. So can we just mix semen with rosazurin and either have a look at the colour change or measure fluorescence? Um, so to do this, we needed to um, we needed to basically separate out the effect of the sperm cells, which is what we're interested in. Obviously, seminal plasma doesn't fertilize the egg; it's the sperm cell that does that, and the other stuff that's in a dismount sample. So we this is um, just showing um, a dose response with rosazurin incubated with isolated horse sperm, and you can see that it really nicely um, does reduce that rosazurin, and we get an increase in fluorescence. But then when we add rosazurin to other um, stuff that you might, might be expecting to find in a dismount sample, like blood and obviously seminal plasma, because that's what the sperm are sitting in in semen, we find that um, white blood cells or leukocytes and seminal plasma can actually also really effectively reduce this rosazurin. So that's a problem because we don't want that to be um, masking the effects on the sperm. So what this told us was two things that the previously published um, and patented um, sperm assessment device is really just measuring the ability of white blood cells and seminal plasma to, uh, to reduce rosazurin, which isn't super helpful. And so for our device, we're going to need to be able to isolate sperm from other contaminants that might be present. So we undertook our first field trial. And during this field trial, um, dismount samples were collected. Um, we ran some um, conventional sperm assessments like motility, morphology, um, and sperm concentration. 
And then the way that we thought that we would isolate the sperm cells from all the other junk in the dismount sample was to do a swim up assay. So swim up technique rather. So swim up just involved layering um, a, a culture media on top of the dismount sample and it allows the sperm to swim up out of that dismount sample and into the culture media where we can um, aspirate them off and then we can incubate them with rosazurin which then becomes fluorescent depending and the degree of fluorescence depends on how many sperm we have and how metabolically active they are um, and we can then read that fluorescence using a, a big clunky piece of lab equipment called a plate reader. So obviously this required um, you know, a lot of equipment and expertise um, and time that isn't necessarily available in the shed. But our preliminary results were pretty encouraging. We found that um, when we separated uh, our samples into those um, which uh, were dismount samples which were collected uh, from breedings which were successful, so they resulted in pregnancy or not successful, so they did not result in pregnancy. We had no difference really in morphology or motility, which are sort of the conventional um, parameters that you'd assess. However, um, the rosacea and fluorescence was significantly higher in those successful breedings. So this gave us a lot of confidence that we were onto something and to move on. And using that um, preliminary data, we were able to secure um, a grant from AgriFutures Australia um, to produce a device which we um, coined Aquility. And this device, um, the idea of this is that we can diagnose fertility by measuring oxidative phosphorylation in the sperm. So using rosazurin, um, obviously, as our reagent. And our first season had really promising results. It showed that, um, that the fluorescence from dismount samples derived from breedings which were successful was um, significantly higher than the unsuccessful breeding. So this really just um, replicated what we'd done previously, but this time we were using an automated device to do those readings. And so this was touted as a speedy test to solve a long running problem in the thoroughbred industry and attracted quite a lot of attention. And then of course we had COVID and we had um, closed downs and uh, we couldn't travel and we couldn't get parts for our devices. So we had to do a lot of um, a lot of validation work and, um, and background research using our research um, pony stallions. And during this time, it occurred to us that we might have a problem. And that is that, yes, we can measure the quality of those sperm cells, so their ability to undergo oxidative phosphorylation, but still the number that are being deposited um, is really important um, to know. And we don't know this because we don't know what the volume of that ejaculate is. So um, in the words of a uh, very famous um, reproductive biochemist, Roger Short, uh, who was talking about dismount samples, he said, you can't tell how many people got on the train based on how many are still standing on the station. And this is a really good analogy. So how are we going to overcome this problem? And this is just an example of, of what I'm getting at here. So here we have a very... Um, small volume but highly concentrated ejaculate and here we have a very large volume but more dilute ejaculate however in both of these samples we have the same total number of sperm so they're actually just as fertile as each other however if we take a small aliquot from each sample and this is analogous to a dismount sample and we don't know how much the volume was originally, well then that sample on the left is going to look great and the one on the right is going to look rubbish, even though they were actually, you know, the same total number of sperm that were deposited. So we need a way basically of measuring not only the sperm metabolic rate, but also the volume of that ejaculate. And can we measure the volume using our dismount sample? So we know that things like prolonged teasing will increase the um, ejaculate volume and that's because we have contributions from um, all of our accessory glands um, and the more teasing, for example, that the, that the horse does, the larger that volume is going to be and therefore the more dilute your sample will be. And this is really going to cloud what, we're, what our readings are telling us. So the way that... Um, that I propose that we overcome this is by measuring a particular enzyme that is only in the epididymis. So the epididymis is where the sperm is stored. So as the sperm becomes more dilute um, with a, a more voluminous ejaculate, so does the concentration of this enzyme. So, and this really nice study that came out um, quite a few years ago now showed that there was an inverse relationship between the concentration of this enzyme in the ejaculate and ejaculate volume. And um, 
preliminary studies that we've done um, over the last few months with our research pony stallions has shown that the same to be true for the dismount sample. So moving forward, this is what we're going to be using um, to correct for that um, that potentially very dilute sample issue. So we should be able to calculate the number of metabolically active sperm in the ejaculate by taking our equality, uh, equality readout and multiplying that by the inverse of our enzyme concentration. So this will should be a much more accurate and more powerful readout. So this is what equality looks like right now. Um, I, sorry, I don't have my, I can't work out how to get a laser pointer, but, um, uh, you can see the we've got the, the, the box of equality. You open the lid. There's a drawer on the side, which is the, the little image labelled B there. We put our dismount sample in there. We then lower a cartridge into the top of the machine, and I've got them crossed out here because that's where all the magic happens, and uh, this is our potentially patentable um, element. So in this cartridge um, is where we can separate the sperm from the other contaminants in the ejaculate, and then uh, and then the resazure and reduction assay happens in there as well, and then we get a readout on the screen of the equality device. So the field trial that we're currently involved in, I'm out at Widden Stud now as we speak, um, in Derek Field's office actually. I don't know if Derek's out there, but they sent me here. I'm not here of my own doing. So we get the dismount samples. Um, we're going to run Aquility continuously over one hour, and that's a typical readout that we see um, over an hour. Um, and we're going to also collect an aliquot of that dismount sample and freeze it for enzyme quantification. So we're going to take some conventional um, sperm measurements as well, just to compare them, um, get our pregnancy results, and then divide those data up into samples which resulted uh, which were obtained from breedings which did or did not um, result in a pregnancy. And then we can use that data to separate our equality readings and, uh, and work out uh, the best time for the maximum prognostic value. So this is going to look like at the end of the day when this is a commercial product on, on the bench, um, stallion um, breeds the mare, um, we get a dismount sample, we run it on equality. If it's all good and the fluorescence is great, well, that mare can then go out into the paddock and have her foal. Um, the stallion can go back to the breeding shed at the next session and cover the next mare. However, if it's a bad reading, then there's still time before that mare ovulates. Um, and if the, the stallion's book allows it, um, to rebreed that mare or, or cross cover that mare to increase the number of fertile sperm that are waiting for the egg. So with that, I would like to acknowledge our collaborators, um, the four um, farms that we've worked with over many, many years, Widden, Arrowfield, Dali and Vinery, um, all under the umbrella of the Hunter Valley Equine Research Centre, uh, the people at the University of, of Newcastle, so in the uh, in ANFF and the PRC in Reproductive Science, um, and of course our funding partners, so AgriFutures Australia, who've now um, funded two iterations of this project, and um, all of our background research, which was funded by the Australian Research Council's um, linkage scheme. Um, and furthermore, with Australian Research Council funding, I just discovered yesterday that I've got a future fellowship um, and that future fellowship is gonna support me to continue this um, research for the next uh, four years. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. That's an amazing presentation. It just goes to show the amazing work that you guys do and the time it takes to actually come up with a product like this. It's it's incredible. But if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat now. Otherwise, we will go straight over to uh, Dr. Aliona Swigan. If anybody does have any questions for our last presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat and I can go back and ask them at the end, but um, without further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Aliona Swigan. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for um, the opportunity to give an update on our project. I assume you can see the, um, the presentation up there? Yep, sure can. Great. Um, so I work quite closely with the NERA at the University of Newcastle. Um, I'm, I'm a researcher here as well. And this is a somewhat, um, so my background is in veterinary practice and I worked in practice for a couple of years before I got um, seduced by the wonders of research. And I'm also really interested in male fertility. But one of the 
the things that um, we've started to introduce into our research program is um, the female side of things and early pregnancy in the mare because this seems to be one of the under-researched areas where we do have a lot of questions about what's going on. Um, and so this is a somewhat younger project um, and was actually first really funded ever by, um, by AgriFutures Australia through the Thoroughbred Horses Program. So very excited to get this off the ground and we've been working on this for the last couple of years. Um, so there's a couple of aspects to this, but by way of background, there was um, a study a few years ago that basically showed that if we look at mares at day two post ovulation, um, of the mares that have been bred, actually about 90% are successfully conceiving. Um, but by the time we scan them, at, you know, which typically happens at day 14, as I'm sure you know, we're only seeing a pregnancy rate of about 65%. Um, so what this means is that uh, about 10% of mares are not conceiving, but then another uh, sort of 25 look like they are losing their embryos quite early on before we even get to to scan them. Um, but ultimately those two things combined mean that uh, about you know, one third to one half of mares after each breeding cycle will scan in negative and they'll return to be bred again. And also what we learn from this is that the risk of early embryo loss is quite high and we don't really understand why. So um, Zamira talked quite a lot about this. Um, this is the same study that I will reference where we know that um, the age of um, of weanlings when they go to sale is co strongly correlated with the hammer price um, and basically you know a breeding operation is, is, is suffering economically every day that um, that a mare isn't getting pregnant so timing is really important we've got a really short breeding season and even if we're not talking sale prices of course physiologically there is that that limited window of opportunity for us to breed these mares um, so really the idea behind this is to be getting this pregnant earlier. So, if, you know, typically what happens is, of course, we have our ultrasound at day 14. And if that mare scans in negative, well, then she can't be bred until the next estrus. What might happen if we had a pregnancy test at day seven is that you could short cycle that mare and then rebreed her just a few days earlier. But it all adds up over the season. Um, and what you know, and especially if you, I guess, if you think about mares that come back multiple times, um, if each each cycle is that little bit shorter, she might have an extra opportunity by the end of that season to go and foal rather than be left barren until the next season. So all of this would have economic benefits. And the other side of this is really understanding the biology of why and how embryo loss happens, because that's still something we know quite little about. And if we can understand some of those mechanisms, we're hoping that further down the track, we might be able to come up with some, um, some treatments to address this major cause of breeding inefficiency. So the priority objective um, that AgriFutures had identified in the, in the last round of rd &E priorities um, that this project falls under is the research leading to the early diagnosis of pregnancy in mares. Um, and there were two components, like I mentioned. So the first is working on an early pregnancy test. And the way that we are doing this is by collecting blood from pregnant and non-pregnant mares and really comparing various aspects of the biochemistry in those samples so that we can then use that knowledge to hopefully develop something that might look like a nice and simple uh, test for early pregnancy. And the second component is really trying to understand more about the interaction between the embryo and the endometrium of the mare, uh, because there's a lot of communication that goes on between the two that we don't know much about and then hopefully use this to develop treatment. So ultimately, we are hoping that we'll uh, attain a shorter foaling interval and reduce embryo loss. So on the pregnancy test side of the project, it's a fairly simple, conceptually experimental design. So we're working with our collaborating studs in the Hunter Valley and we're collecting uh, plasma samples at day seven and day 14. Um, and then we're taking advantage of some mass spectrometry technology that we have access to here, which is a really great opportunity, I suppose, in that this kind of technology is rarely made available to people like us in the veterinary and agricultural space. It's often 
reserved for um, for, for biomedical sort of applications, and um, it's really nice that we get to, to access it. And what this can do is is analyze these samples at a really really high resolution and give us a lot of information that we previously haven't been able to get in the more basic kind of biochemistry tests and. We can learn a lot um, about all of almost all of the, the proteins and the lipids and the um, the metabolic sort of components that are floating around in the blood of the mare that we might be able to use to distinguish pregnant and non-pregnant animals. Then the next step after doing a kind of screening component is really identifying some candidate proteins or lipids or metabolites. And then validating these to make sure that the biology underlying this is really solid before we go on to design a prototype test using these uh, candidate biomarkers that then um, can evolve in, in future research into something very practical that we can use on farm. And looking at embryo maternal interactions, the approach here is uh, recovering embryos from mares generated um, in vivo. And then uh, essentially incubating these in a dish with something called endometrial organoids. And what these are are kind of little blobs of cells that are cultured in 3D and um, they're able to mimic a lot of the functions of the endometrium. So they're, they're quite similar structurally. They have glands. They release some of the same um, components that the endometrium does. And so we can uh, really get a closer look at the the biological interactions that happen um, between the embryo and how, you know, how the embryo signals its presence and what can kind of go wrong during that process um, and, and get a really close look at this by doing these experiments in the lab. And also then look at what this, this model of the endometrium does in response um, because the, the hypothesis is that uh, some of these things don't always go to plan. Um, and we're hoping to find out more about this than we suspect that some of these things are leading to early embryo loss in the men. Um, so I'll focus mostly on the pregnancy test uh, component today, um, but this is the sort of timeline of um, the project, which is coming into its, into its third year now. So we've, um, we've collected the bloods and we've identified a series of biomarkers and we're now refining and validating um, those biomarkers before we hopefully generate a, a sort of prototype before the completion of the project. And on the embryo maternal interaction size, um, we've got um, we've got all our tissues and we're wrapping up the, the final in vitro experiments before we do the analysis on those. So um, the first part of the, the screening component for the early pregnancy test project was looking at proteins using a proteomic platform. Um, and so we've looked at lots of day seven and day 14, of course, the day seven ones are the exciting ones that we're interested in. And so this is what's called a volcano plot. And, um, you know, essentially there's, there's often a, a kind of overload of data, but what we want to see are proteins that are, um, that are coming up both as statistically significant, so they're consistent, um, so they're towards the, the top of the chart and the ones uh, closer to the to the outside on the horizontal axis are the ones that are kind of most dramatically up or down regulated in the pregnant versus the non-pregnant animals. Um, and so we're, we're seeing quite a few that fit that profile and some that are more uh, more consistent than others. Um, so one of the um, uh, one of the proteins in the serpent family up here is um, have come up as quite um, quite consistently different between pregnant and non-pregnant animals. So this is pretty exciting given that you know, for a long time it was thought that there are no real um, changes in the circulation of the mare uh, in response to pregnancy until day 14 or at best day 10 following ovulation. So we are seeing that there are, there are um, some physiological changes that can help us pick up those pregnancies quite early on. Um, so overall, there were nine proteins that we considered statistically significant between um, di significantly different between pregnant and non-pregnant animals. Um, but of course, we want those to be really consistently different um, before we can go forward with those as a as a pregnancy test. And what we're thinking is going to happen. So this is just another way of visualizing it. Um, but basically, so we've got pregnant horses on this side and the non-pregnant ones here. 
and the um, the red are up regulated and the green are down regulated proteins. So we can see that some go up and some go down um, in response to pregnancy. But what we're thinking is that we're going to need a panel of two or three or four uh, proteins that we can combine together to give us a, a robust test. Um, and so when we do this, we combine them into a formula. Um, we get a pretty good separation of the the pregnant and not pregnant animals if we look back on our current data set. Um, so what we can see is that if we draw a line at a sort of theoretical um, cutoff here, we can see that the pregnant animals all cluster quite closely below that line. Um, so this is really important that we're not getting any pregnant animals showing up in the um, in the non-pregnant space because we don't want to be accidentally picking up pregnant animals as, as non-pregnant. This has pretty um, dire consequences. But most of the non-pregnant animals will come up above the threshold. And then we've got um, you know, what we're calling our false positives down here. And this is um, you know, not ideal, but also it is to be expected, um, uh, partly because uh, if we're collecting these bloods at day seven and then confirming uh, animals as pregnant or non-pregnant at day 14, we do expect to be picking up um, some that were pregnant um, at day seven that have since lost their embryos and therefore they're scanning in as non-pregnant at day 14. So some of this is, is an expected result. Um, so this is a sort of example of, of where this um, pregnancy test is headed, so we're going to use a combination of um, of factors uh, in the plasma that we can then take forward for a test. So that's just the proteins. Then we're um, also conducting a lipidomics study. Uh, this is still underway, and this is a similar sort of volcano plot. Unfortunately, lipids are much um, much more poorly characterized than proteins, so we don't have um, we don't have nice names for them, and we also don't have um, as much information about what they do. But we're certainly seeing some that are quite, um, quite dramatically up and down regulated in response to pregnancy, and this is um, still ongoing. Um, and then on top of that, we're also uh, doing a similar sort of screen for metabolomics, so some of the small molecules um, floating around in the blood that um, may also differ between pregnant and non-pregnant animals. So this is just a very brief summary of, of um, where we're at and what we're currently doing for both um, the proteomics and the lipidomics is moving on to some more targeted techniques where we can really make sure that those changes are consistent across a large um, data set of animals and then we're going to move forward and, and um, design a, a a device that, at least in theory, you know, we can take forward into into further projects, as um, as you will have observed from the mirror's presentation. The the device design and optimization component of these kind of studies is a whole story in itself. So I just want to introduce you to the people that have been doing the work, most of the work that um, that was presented in that talk. So Rukmali. Here on the left has been doing um, has really taken the lead on the pregnancy test project and has been very laboriously working through these huge data sets and processing hundreds of samples. Steph has been working on the uh, endometrial organoid project and um, Alicia has been the, um, the the research technician that has made it all possible for us as well. Um, and of course. Thanking AgriFixtures for the funding and the really generous support of the um, the four studs that we've worked with through the, the Hunter Valley Research Centre as well, and some of the other people in the team at the at the Priority Research Centre for Reproductive Science here at Newcastle. So, um, yeah, that has, this, that has been a very brief update, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. So I will um I will leave it there. Thank you. And just before we go, we actually have a question. So, oh, do we? Beautiful. Oh, we do. It's from um, Dr. Catherine Chicken, our advisory panel chair. So, um, Catherine, you had a question. Ali, Samira, thank you very much for your presentation. So great. Ali, do you envisage that you will have a combination of proteins and lipids as the, um, you know, in the test? Or what are you anticipating from what you've seen so far? 
Uh, so I I am hopeful for um, for a protein a multiple protein panel. Um, I think where we are at in the wider scientific space with detecting proteins, it's it's a more linear, it's a, a more straightforward process. Um, but it, it it could still be a combination of all of them. I just think that is going to be more challenging to design. Um, I I'm so I'm I'm hopeful we can get away with protein. But the the lipids are showing up some some really interesting biology as well. So I don't want to I don't want to give up on them. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Annalise. Uh, could I ask Samira how um, consistent is the oxpos level on a ejaculate to ejaculate uh, basis, Samira, per stallion, as it were? Yeah. Well, we are. Um, so I'm right now collecting that data, but I haven't actually analysed it. So the previous runs, we basically got um, we got data from every stallion, uh, but only a few, two or three um, ejaculates. And uh, it was quite variable in that case. So this time round, we're going to, we're focusing on just four stallions so that we can get a lot more, um, a lot stronger, uh, larger sort of sample sizes um, within that stallion. Uh, what I'm seeing is just what I'm seeing on the screen. So I'm, I can't give you anything other than sort of a qualitative answer. And that is that uh, I see very similar patterns um, for, you know, within within the stallion. Um, I've only been doing it now for a week and a half. So I think that their ejaculate quality probably won't have changed that much in that period of time. Um, but interesting things like if there's a lot of gel in the sample, um, it will take a lot longer for the fluorescence to start to increase because I think it takes a bit more time for the sperm to actually escape that um, gelatinous seminal plasma. Uh, and, you know, obviously uh, stallions who are, we call them jelly monsters, tend to be have a gelatinous ejaculate, you know, most of the time. It's not sort of um, a, a hit and miss thing. So, um, yeah, long story short, yes, they seem to be fairly consistent patterns, but... Um, that's just within a, a small time frame. So, you know, I, I think that the, 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 the magnitude of the fluorescence intensity will differ a lot more over time. Okay, thank you. 